Good afternoon, Carl. It's nice to see you uh, uh, today, and thanks for joining us. Likewise. I hope you're well. Uh, we're, we're doing well, and we look forward to uh, talking with you this morning. And, and thank you so much, Carl, for uh, taking what was originally scheduled as a catch-up between you and me and agreeing to go live with it. Uh, so, Great pleasure. Well, yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, joining us uh, for this conversation uh, this morning here in the U.S. and uh, in the afternoon in where many of you are and perhaps in the evening uh, for those of you joining us from, from Asia. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Global Business School Network, we are a um, network of leading uh, business schools worldwide uh, that are connected with business, um, governments, NGOs, in a way that helps us to ensure that the developing world has the management and, and entrepreneurship talent uh, it needs to generate prosperity. Um, anyone wanting to know more about GBSN, please uh, visit our website, www.gbsn.org. Uh, welcome again, Carl. Uh, just a, a brief uh, moment to tell everyone about who you are. Um, your bio is um, uh, the short one that we've provided to everyone, and I won't go through the longer one, but uh, just uh, uh, let us uh, know that uh, you've been working in this space for many, many years, and from my perspective, have uh, a, a clear set of insights that we look forward to talking about this morning. Um, uh, Carl is a development practitioner working in a financial institution. I really like how those two things fit together, and we're going to explore that a little bit in our conversation. But before that, he worked with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Malaria. He was a Mo Ibrahim Fellow at the Economic Commission for Africa, and he uh, was working for a time at the African Union D uh, Development Agency on a private sector initiative uh, to fight Ebola in West uh, Africa. So Carl brings with us not only um, the experience in a financial institution, but a rich set of experiences in health. And that's why I was particularly um, excited about uh, connecting with Carl to, to have this conversation about uh, what's happening in Africa um, uh, as it relates to COVID-19. I don't know if you're like me, but uh, for me, I still, uh, despite living in a global world, I still feel like the information that we have uh, about what happens in various parts of the world is still very limited. So we're, we're curious about what's happening in Africa, about your point of view, and about how we see Africa rising in the context of uh, COVID-19. You know, as a starting point, I, uh, Carl, when I reached out uh, uh, initially, I wasn't sure if you were going to be in the uh, the Ivory Coast where you grew up, or in Togo where your office is, or uh, but it turns out you're in South Africa. Absolutely, I'm in South Africa, um, and uh, thank you again for allowing me time to discuss. It's been good to catch up, and most certainly in this time of uncertainty, the, the question is really around how do we. Uh, in every community where we are, do what we can to ensure that there is hope and there is an element of uh, certainty as to the progress that we can make. And for my part, it's been very much along the lines of what I've done for the past few years in different organizations, but really looking at what every organization can offer uh, the best. So if you take a financial institution, today the question around um, using digital financial services is extremely important in an environment where physical proximity and physical distancing are becoming two elements of the same coin. In certain communities, physical proximity is important for the daily livelihood. In other community, physical distancing is acceptable so that you can use other means to, to ensure that you can earn your living. So, on the African continent today, we are in a situation where not a lot of testing has been done, and the Africa CDC is looking at ramping up testing. At the same time, the two countries that have tested the most, being South Africa and, and Ghana, 
are showing some signs of releasing some of the measures that they put in place to ensure that physical distancing allows for the virus not to spread as fast as possible. At the in same South, time, in, in South sorry? Africa, if we just start with South Africa, uh, one of my colleagues in South Africa says, right now it's a level five lockdown. What, what exactly for our audience does that mean? So level five basically means that we have to remain at home with limited ability to leave our homes and remain with our families. Um, we can go to the shop for a limited amount of time for people that can afford to be in a confined environment. It is probably easier to do, but if you are not able to do so, there are certain measures that people need to do, which are uh, hand washing, for example, wearing a mask if it's possible, but Level five basically means total lockdown. Tomorrow on the 1st of May, we are moving to level four, which will ease some of the restrictions, uh, allow a certain group of people to be able to go to work um, and provide some element of, uh, of relief. But we can't um, be at ease with a virus that we don't really fully understand at the moment. And that's a reality for the whole world. Uh, a virus is spreading. There is a certain level of understanding, but not full of understanding of what it represents. So we are slowly getting there. Uh, I think moving from level five to level four implies that the health response that was mounted by South Africa has provided the level of um, the data, the level of certainty to move in a certain direction. Though we were warned that if the numbers go up again, we may revert to level five. Well, that's. That's uh, great to hear, especially uh, in the crowded townships, you would expect that um, social or physical distancing is a, is a big challenge. It, it is a challenge. And I think the, the reality of this crisis has, should allow us to rethink how we deal with vulnerable communities, which in most of our countries represent the majority. Um, and I, I, I think the question around um, physical proximity and there's an article that I wrote a couple of days ago in the context of World Malaria Day, asking the question around what does mosquito physical proximity means in the concept of physical distancing. So those are, this is one aspect of a disease that kills millions of people and that has killed millions of people and continue to be a threat to most parts of the continent. COVID-19 brings that question around remaining in physical proximity of those that, of your family but in most instances, in areas where physical proximity is a reality on a daily basis, not only for living conditions, but also for the ability to actually make your daily living. So these are challenging times for policymakers to think about what is it that we need to improve in urban planning, what it needs that we need to improve in terms of the jobs that are required to ensure that people have access to more resources for um, having decent accommodation. So the township situation that we, in, in South Africa, is a challenge for other places in the world. Uh, in Africa, uh, Kibera, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, where there is a uh, Shofko, which is a, a, an NGO that has uh, worked with communities to ensure that they have access to soap and water. They've even done, uh, I was reading an article this morning where 400 tests were done and the number of people have, uh, Affected by COVID was very low. I don't remember the exact percentage. But COVID-19 gives us that opportunity to really ask ourselves a question. What would the world with COVID-19 will look like? Because I don't think the virus would just go away in a few months. It will probably stay with us. Therefore, if physical distancing is a, is a new norm, what does it mean for urban planning? What does it mean for the majority of members of our communities? If we go back to 2014 in, uh, in Zerekore, where the first Ebola case was uh, uh, started, we have to remember that the first responders were community members. In the context of COVID-19, in most places on the continent, it came by plane. Therefore, it started with a group of Africans or, or people living in Africa that actually traveled. And you have this sort of difference between COVID-19 and Ebola, which is an important data point to rethink the challenge of access to health and also how viruses spread. And would we have had the same reaction to a virus that spread, was spreading in, in a rural area 
compared to one that is spreading in cities. And clearly, COVID-19 gives us the answer to that. Well, you know, this, this question about how it started is an interesting one and one that's come up in several conversations. But I want to go back to something you said about the most vulnerable communities. And in and, and Africa, many parts of Africa, there's a large informal sector, right, as much as 90 90%. So the way the economics interact with uh, the health um, question is a, is, a, is a different one in, in the context of uh, many parts of Africa. Could you talk with us a little bit about how you see that informal co economy either working for or against the community in this um, fight? So it's important to remember that the majority of informal workers in the world are not in Africa. They're actually in Asia. There's an ILO report that clearly outlines that, which, is, which was an interesting point for me to pick up when I was uh, doing some reading around, around that issue. In the context of Africa, yes, the informal sector is, represents about 80% in most of our, of our countries. But at the same time, we have to remember that it is an important source of employment on the continent. Therefore, COVID-19, the real question is how do we ensure that we help individuals in the informal sector based on what their needs are to move them along a certain value chain. So let me take an example. Um, many people will buy plantains in West Africa to make one of their favorite dishes, a loco, uh, which is fried plantain. That value chain comes from a rural area and to the city via a network either of women or men and so on and so on. So the connection between the city and the rural areas is often done by women for foods and other items that are used in the community. The real question, how do we ensure that these women and the network that she has access to can continue to do their business in a safe manner? So we have a situation where a mall is allowed to function in some countries, um, whereas markets at the beginning were not too sure how to operate but the market draws more people and they provide a livelihood for more people. So the question about informality needs to be accepted as a reality in the context in which we are and not as an impediment. So the informality of the sector can actually be improved if we decide, for example, to rethink what a market looks like and not transform every single market into a mall, but provide adequate sanitation, adequate stock, um, storage and facilities for all the different producers that are sold in those markets. Therefore, maintaining the supply chain and the cold chain are key elements of improving the conditions in which informal markets actually operate. You're on mute, my friend. I like the way you described that. Thanks. I, I <laughs> want to make sure that uh, there's no noise on this end of impacting your, the conversation. But I like the way you describe it as a potential, as, as a different way of looking at the economic sector, and, um, but, but thinking of it as a possibility of, of even being a, a strength. You know, we've all, we all see the data about healthcare in Africa in general. We realize. Um, Africa is a very diverse continent. Uh, but if you look at the overall data, it's 16% you know, of the population, but only 2% of the health expenditures globally, which total at what, $9.7 trillion. But, but only 3% of the healthcare workers uh, globally are in Africa. Uh, despite Africa bearing, uh, what, about a quarter of the global uh, disease burden, as it's described. Yeah. So we all see the data. Can you take us inside the healthcare uh, system? Because that's obviously why we think we talk about flattening the curve, right? Because of the pressure on the healthcare system, which is already, according to these data, uh, uh, weaker in um, Africa potentially than other parts of the world. Could you take us inside the, the system a little bit and how it's working um, uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19? So I think the, the starting point is that flattening the curve is probably something that we've been doing uh, for the most part since we have had a series of epidemics, HIV AIDS, um, Zika, 
uh, Ebola, uh, Lassa fever in Nigeria, for example, which is still ongoing. So all these elements have been helping African countries to strengthen as best as they can the health system. It is not perfect, for sure. At the same time, what we're realizing is that the question around health system is also a universal issue. Because at the same time, Africa has been trying to flatten the curve, and so far, based on the information that is available, we seem to be in a zone where the implications of COVID-19 are mild for now, and the economic impact will be much stronger. But if we then think about what is the ideal health system that we're looking for in, in, in our communities, number one is to rethink the whole point around last mile compared to first mile. I think first mile should be the rural area because that's where most people start and move towards the city. So what kind of health facilities do we need to put at the first mile so that diseases that can be picked up early enough are diagnosed and treated? Once we advance the question around thinking about the rural area as a starting point, we will make progress in the health system. A lot of the best health facilities are concentrated in urban areas. But at the same time, we know today that the majority of Africans live in rural areas. So from a policy perspective, we have to think of a way in which diseases are detected early. So let's take, for example, a group of diseases like neglected tropical disease. There are 20 diseases. You may be familiar with some of them. Elephantiasis is one of them, where you have a swelling of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, feet. You also have uh, worms that affect children that go to school. So what is the impact of ensuring that every child is deworked? Probably improvement in access to school. So the question of health system, yes, there's a, there are a few diseases that have been uh, sort of supported by donors like HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. Others are, are not necessarily. So we need to ask the question in COVID-19, how do we ensure that anyone that access a health facility has access to health, regardless of which diseases that may, they, they may have. Which means the whole architecture of health funding or health financing needs to start to shift more and more towards health system strengthening. We've been speaking about health system strengthening from the time I joined uh, the fund in, in 2004. This discussion is still ongoing, but if we look at the flow of funding, we still do a lot of vertical programming for HIV, for TB, for malaria, and, and disease specific. What COVID-19 then brings is a question around ventilators, for example. And the numbers that have been floating is the number of ventilators per country in many of the African countries. Yes, it is a challenge not to have a ventilator. At the same time, preventing the person to get to the ventilator should have been the first thing to think about in the beginning. But I, I don't have the data, but I will assume that not many donors are funding ventilators. That may change post-COVID-19 uh, peak. But is it really about the ventilators, or is it really to ensure that prevention, prevention, prevention in all sorts of diseases that may affect um, our, our countries, our, our citizens, sorry, are actually um, taken care of? So health systems, a lot of investment, disease burden, high. But it's time to ask ourselves a question, who should get access to the best care? And the reason why rural areas are important is because of the agriculture part. Agriculture is an important role in the transformation of any society. We've seen it in Asia, we've seen it in America, we've seen it in other parts of the world. And as long as we don't connect the needs for agriculture with the need to ensure that the, the Africans that are involved in agriculture are well and healthy, then we have a problem in terms of where we allocate resources for health access to health. So there's a lot of data, of course, out there in terms of what this represents and how this can be addressed. The most important part is to start to think about what does first mile health looks like. And that first mile health should then determine how do we make sure that people have access to what they need in, in, in a timely fashion. COVID-19 starts in the city. Most cities were the first that were affected. And then it does demonstrate that the virus basically came with people that have ability to travel. Majority of people in rural areas do not travel that far to go and pick up a virus uh, somewhere. They have other issues that they need to address. I mentioned NTDs, I mentioned diarrhea, I mentioned pneumonia. I mean, I'm mentioning pneumonia. 
So those are some of the diseases that we know exist in our community. And if we address them, it means that we we'll have to reinforce the system to ensure that the nurse, the doctor in the rural area can actually pick up those elements early so that we can prevent before the person actually has an issue. So I agree we have a challenge in terms of the health system, but it's also a challenge on how we look at what needs to be funded, when it needs to be funded, and for which purpose. And in my view, any investment in health needs to be to secure the workforce of the continent and ensure that no longer no children or pregnant women dies of malaria, for example. And, and this focus on the rural versus the urban first, I think, is a very interesting one. But I, I also hear you describing uh, a healthcare system that's more focused on the human than on the disease, right? You said that uh, historically we've been more vertical. We, we try to tackle malaria. We try to tackle uh, well, COVID-19. We're focused on the disease, but the human focus through the healthcare system seems like a, a big point that you're making as well. Yes, and it's a very important one in my view, uh, simply because if we start looking at the journey of a human being in society from the time they are born until they, they pass on, we know that there are certain diseases that they may or may not be exposed to depending on the number of people. Um, is COVID-19, for example, a lifestyle disease, for example? Because those who travel seem to have picked it, picked it up. Uh, is it, would it be the same as uh, what we treat at the NCDs, for example? Um, but at, this, at, at the center of it is how uh, countries themselves set up the system and look at the journey of the different of the citizens. And that journey needs to focus on the majority. Today, the majority is in rural areas. Maybe in 2015, if you're looking at the data, will probably be at around 50-50, or maybe earlier than that in most, African, in most African cities. So the question around where do we allocate resources has to be linked to, number one, majority and vulnerable people on one hand. Number two, who are actually producing? The producers are in rural areas. Majority of people in urban areas basically will sell the produce of coffee, cocoa, and other, other commodities. Um, uh, for export. But I think the, the, the one model that we will probably start to think a little bit more closely about in this period of COVID where we look at the human being and what does a human being need in terms of access to health will become very important. I, I appreciate the connections you've already begun to draw, draw between uh, the health and the economic development of uh, our communities and um, Africa in general. You pointed to the rural versus the, um, the agriculture versus the manufacturing. And at, at the moment, Africa is still not strong in manufacturing. And as we've begun to discover in this global world where we're competing for equipment, uh, PPE and ventilators and things like that, this is a challenge. And um, you know, so I appreciate you, you drawing on that connection. But, uh, and we'll come back to this connection a little bit to talk a little bit about how um, um, health impacts uh, more generally uh, economic development. And that's obviously one reason why GBSN cares about what's happening right now in Absolutely. Uh, work, right? Absolutely. So but let's turn to finance a little bit. This, you're, you're working in a financial institution and finance becomes a pretty important part of, of um, uh, our experience with COVID-19. I, I, I think I've seen different estimates, but initially I saw an estimate of, that it would cost about $200 billion for Africa to fight uh, COVID-19. And uh, at the same time, um, you know, many countries in Africa already carry a heavy debt burden. There's not a lot of what we, what we economists call, as you are, uh, call fiscal space in order to um, uh, fight from a financial perspective, uh, this disease. But at the same time, I know that there are efforts um, um, to um, pool resources. Uh, I remember talking with you um, last year about uh, your belief that uh, much of 
financing could be driven by the improvements in the household income, both inside Africa and with the diaspora. And at the same time, we, we um, have been starting to move to a more integrated Africa. How does all this fit together in a way that gives us hope for the way we might be able to finance this fight? And especially as you've noted, uh, the world after COVID-19 is really a world with COVID-19 on an ongoing basis. So uh, the debt, if you read on the, on the debt discussion about Africa, we certainly not in a position where we have borrowed too much because borrowing is always about what the money is used for. Africa has been for the past 25 years growing continuously. It's the first recession in 25 years that we're going to hit, which means that part of the borrowing has probably been used to a good effect. Um, so I, I don't think we should just look in terms of the debt situation, but there's also a question about the interest rate. Um, most African countries pay more in terms of interest rate than the rest, and because of the perception of risk. So this is probably an opportunity in that context to try and also rethink the way we look at uh, risk in, for, for an African country. I also think that uh, when it comes to uh, the economic situation, it's going to be very difficult. There's no doubt about it. Because when people are not able to move, the activity which is related to all the different aspects of it is also understand still. So if you take the airline industry, for example, uh, Ethiopian, airline, uh, Ethiopian airline has been one of the best airlines in the world. And today they cannot fly. And if they can't fly, they, they, the, the world is not designed for airplanes to be parked on airport. Therefore, there's a, there are a number of costs that accrue to this uh, particular situation. The, the, we also in a, in a position where it is hard to say exactly what this will look like in, in months to come. But one thing which I, I strongly believe in, it gives us an opportunity as Africans to ask ourselves a question around how do we pull our resources? The Africa CDC, for example, which didn't exist six years ago when we had Ebola in West Africa, now exists, which means that you can actually coordinate the response for uh, a pandemic on the African continent. That's exactly what they're doing. But they need our resources. If one individual in diaspora can actually contribute $20, $50 and pull these resources, we then have and then an opportunity to ensure that we have what it takes with domestic resources, with also resources from the diaspora, with us, uh, with uh, an Africa CDC, which is finally fully funded. I strongly believe that it's important because uh, in 1951, when the US Center for Disease Control was created, it was born out of the elimination of malaria in, in, the, in, in the United States of America. So being in that position where we use our resources to strengthen institution, provides an opportunity to ensure that there is continuity in the response. There's also things that we have learned that we can just continue to replicate and, and adapt. And if you look at the response to COVID-19 on the African continent, the fact that we have had different pandemics has allowed us to probably understand certain things that we could do better and do our best to limit uh, the, the, the challenge. So I think, um, the, the situation will evolve. No one can really predict. But if Africa needs a fiscal, the fiscal space, the, the initiatives that are ongoing that are led by the African Union uh, for debt relief, and these are important initiatives because you can negotiate as a group instead of going to negotiate as one. And those are important in this moment to ensure that there is a larger group which can negotiate at once. At the end of the day, most countries will have larger debts to get out of this situation. Getting out of the situation, we don't see what exactly look like. But at the moment, we are going down. It will probably be a U and not a V, like the disease has done in Singapore. And we just have to wait and understand how, how large the bottom part of the U will. And are we ready when this change to ensure that we use all the productive means on our, in our respective countries to move? But the productive means of all these respective countries can no longer be a national response. It has to be a regional or pan-African response. Therefore, the continental free trade area, which was supposed to be 
uh, I think launch in July has been postponed, unfortunately. But this is a time to really push forward because integration uh, in times like this is a key to accelerate the recovery. We can't stand behind borders and expect that um, countries on their own will be able to resolve the matter. It's not possible. Yeah, I, I agree. And if I understand uh, correctly, well, a couple of points. One is there's a, a rising set of questions about how integrated the world will become as a consequence of this or, or less integrated. Right? But definitely regionally, we see this um, uh, happening. If I understand correctly, for Ebola, there was a, a 50 country coalition formed Absolutely. around fighting this. And it seems like that kind of experience has been valuable uh, already on the continent. But, but at the same time, Dan, if you look, what was interesting about Ebola is that we had a 50 country coalition for three countries that represented less than 1% of Africa's GDP. So now that the entire world GDP is at stake, we don't see this kind of coalition. So I, I, I hope that we'll learn from what has happened in Ebola. And if 1% of GD, Africa's GDP, not even the world GDP, 1% of Africa's GDP got this um, reaction and solidarity, then we should have probably the same level or larger sense of solidarity uh, for, for COVID-19. What, what about, um, you know, the way um, I understand what's happening what's happened with finance in Africa. So there's been a fairly significant progress, obviously not as fast as perhaps um, you would like to see, but uh, with digital financial services, has this been an asset for, for Africa in this fight at the moment? You know, obviously um, as a way to transfer funds, but perhaps even as a way to limit the spread of the disease. So there's one good example in Togo, uh, my country of adoption, where they launched an initiative called Novisi to ensure that uh, using USSD code, so you don't need to have a smartphone, you can use, uh, you can type in a, a code, so the star and, and hash and the number, to be able to register yourself and then receive funds from the government. But this is only possible because the infrastructure, the digital financial service infrastructure over the past few years has been built. But we not yet fully done because once you receive that money on your phone to ensure that you limit your physical proximity, you then should be able to use that money from where you are and receive your goods like you would do, for example, in other countries like South Africa or others that have a delivery mechanism in place, which means there's an opportunity for delivery mechanism system to be put in place. So that if I want to buy my plantain from the lady in the market, I should be able to send her the money and somebody should be able to come and deliver. So COVID-19 is an accelerator to build or actually extend the existing digital financial service infrastructure. Uh, a good friend of mine wrote an article that was published two days ago that looks at the cost of remittances intra-Africa. Africans pay 20% more to send money within Africa. And there should be tools available, and I think there are some, that allow for the cost reduction in these remittances. Because ultimately, once we realize that the, the digital financial service infrastructure is actually the backbone of any um, uh, integration in terms of trade. So if you think of, for example, of Amazon in the US, you never ask yourself, how would I get my, my goods delivered? To me? Because at the back, you have the logistic, the digital financial service infrastructure that gives the required trust within the system so that when you place your order, you receive it. So I, I, I think there are lots of possibilities that will be born out of this situation because it forces us to press pause on a lot of things that we have done and to start to think about how do we improve on the infrastructure that we have? How do we ensure that, again, the lady selling peanuts or selling a piece of cloth or anything else that she might be selling that is required for the community to advance, I can actually get it without having maintaining uh, the, the barrier, the measures that have been put in place for physical distance. Because the reality is that physical proximity is an essential part on how we operate on the continent and in other parts of the world, of course. And how do we then build an infrastructure that allows for a certain level of physical proximity while 
limiting the expansion in this case of COVID-19 or any other disease that may come uh, our way? Well, one of the things I, I have learned from many conversations with people around the world is that there is a belief that COVID-19 is accelerating digital transformation in, in a variety of contexts. So what other kinds of innovations are we seeing? Because this is one of the things that I think is uh, one of the strengths uh, in Africa is, you know, it's, it's not just the solidarity that you describe. Um, it's not just the progress on uh, digital. Uh, and the experience, as you describe with um, other kinds of diseases, infectious or not, um, but this ability or opportunity to innovate. I, I read, I don't know a lot about it, maybe you could tell us uh, about uh, in Senegal, um, this work to uh, not only invent, but, uh, but produce uh, a test that could be showing results in 10 minutes and, yeah. and cost as little as a dollar. Can you tell us Absolutely. a little bit about some of the innovation you see happening? So I read about this, uh, this as well, and I think it's, uh, it's um, a good opportunity for every African out there that can spare a dollar to make sure that when it's available, they spare that dollar to ensure that everyone that needs to be tested is tested. Um, it starts in Senegal and it should spread in the other 55 member states of the African Union. This is one innovation that demonstrates collaboration between different uh, parties, Africa, Europe, and other foundations that have uh, invested resources in this. What I, also see, uh, what I also see is how delivery mechanisms have started to be strengthened so that you can actually get what you need without necessarily leaving your home if you have one. That should be maintained, improved, to ensure that new jobs are created. And that, for me, is probably where um, things will, will, will allow us to have a different uh, way of looking at what we already have. So this Africa we have, which is filled with um, lots of young people that are innovating at, at best as they can. But the most important is how do we connect those innovators? And do we get Africans not to only innovate for their respective environment, but to think about the larger, which is 1.3 billion people? And for that, um, we, we have today the technology that requires to do that. We have the means to do so. Um, and I think those innovations that exist uh, today have basically a green field to be able to expand. The expansion depend, of course, on policy and regulations. And can my innovation just cross the border? Um, can we accelerate those regulations that allow the cross-border uh, uh, movement? And what, what would it look like? And would we then start to change our habits in terms of how we, we buy for these uh, goods and services? Will I be comfortable to continue to stop importing and buying uh, within Africa? You touched early on the point around uh, the global value chain. And this crisis demonstrates that we may have to accept that it may cost more but I'd rather have it produced in Nairobi, in Lome, in Dakar, in Abidjan, in uh, Cairo, and improve infrastructure within Africa so that if I can no longer get the goods from China, I can still get it from within the continent or within the value chain that may not be constrained by the fact that boats are, uh, were no longer moving. So I think it is where the innovation is going to come from, that ability to then look at what on this continent can we produce, transform, and export within um, the different economic zone and eventually within Africa? Yeah, uh, it seems like there'll be significant interest in um, rethinking global supply chains as a consequence of this experience. I want to go back to this innovation question that you, you said it will depend in part on policy and regulation, but it will also depend on talent, right? And that's where uh, we've uh, connected over the last uh, year or so, uh, really on your strong belief that, um, you know, for a financial institution, a large financial institution like Echo Bank with 16,000 employees, there are... Um, 
perhaps more opportunities to develop the leadership and management talent that we need to drive innovation and, um, and uh, even to fight disease than uh, simply writing a paycheck, right? And the combination of, your, or writing a check, I'm sorry, not writing a paycheck, but um, the combination of your, um, your uh, uh, digital platforms and your leadership and management strength and the ability to train and develop people through the academy. Um, I wish uh, Simon were here for this part of the call, Simon Ray, who heads the Echo Bank Academy. But how do you, see, yeah, how do you see talent development and um, education, um, especially management and entrepreneurship education, fitting in, not, not necessarily right now, but as a result of this experience, do you see um, more emphasis on this? So um, if we, if we, when you have across the continent and other parts of the world, 15,000 people, those are 15,000 different skills that you can use in the community. An NGO, for example, facing challenges in terms of um, AML, anti-money laundering, can receive support from an employee on helping them to go through that. It may not have a direct monetary value, but the positioning of that NGO in the community and also vis-a-vis -vis Africans donor or external donors will be strengthened. Or we can look at marketing skills. You can look at leadership and development that is one of the key aspects of EcoBank Academy. The reality is that you will need more people that understand the art of leadership and not necessarily the position of being in leadership. There's a difference between the two in my view. The position allows control over resources and also direction. But you can have someone, for example, who chooses to be a leader in his community. And that leadership does not necessarily come with a position, but it comes with a vision that something needs to change and they're willing to do something about it. When it comes to learning and development, the fact that physical proximity becomes a challenge raises a question as to what is the network of your school who need to do the infrastructure. If people cannot come back, how do we ensure that wherever they are in the world, they can first give those skills to the community, either free of charge or to reduce cost? Because ultimately, the ability to navigate uh, the world in which we are with skills that I uh, will call adaptive learning, is probably one of the best gifts that your network can provide with, of course, EcoBank Academy. Because from, we are, we're not too sure what it will look like when this will subside. But what we know is that the way we've been teaching and the way we've been learning will be very different. And that difference will definitely come from the ability of those that have that are custodian of knowledge and custodian of giving knowledge to ask themselves the question, how, what skills can enhance the ability of somebody living and working in Kibera, for example, so that they can, they can insert themselves into these global value chains or these African value chains. So there will have to be an assessment of what is already available because like, we go from the principle that people already have a certain level of skills and that these skills need to be enhanced in a specific context. And that shift means that you will need to have more localized um, learning. It can be designed centrally, but the local knowledge is extremely, extremely uh, important. The continent is still very young and that in itself presents an opportunity and a challenge. How to ensure that the energy of all these young people across the world and across Africa, because Africa will be the reservoir of young people in, 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 in the world, that energy is not just limited to what they can do in Africa, but what they can do for the world. Um, the disease that we are facing at the moment has hit countries that have old, older populations. So the discussion around immigration will certainly shift in the COVID-19 world, but probably not as fast as it should, 
because at the moment the reaction is very on a nationalistic um, basis. So the skills of a, of a young South Sudanese can be applicable anywhere in the world if he or she is given the opportunity to learn and to apply those skills locally, but also globally. Well, you, so partially, learn, answer, well, you partially answered a question that's come in uh, as you were speaking. And maybe if I just uh, uh, read the question to you, you'll be able to continue on these lines in a, in a uh, more uh, meaningful way. Are there new opportunities that can leverage Africa's comparative advantage in, say, youth, uh, cultural richness, collectivism versus individualism in the global context that might emerge through this crisis? So you started to talk about how, um, you know, what we learn in context can be helpful globally or worldwide. This is a massive global disruption. It suggests that a new way of working, a new way of working and model for economics might emerge. How can African countries best position themselves in this context? And this might come from somebody you know, uh, um, Jamie Darko, who- Yes, I, she, was saying, a, she, was, she, she was a former colleague and uh, a very good friend. Um, the point that she makes is that, and the way at least I, I, I look at it is that, we have always been part of a globalized world. Our mistake was never to industrialize. So industrialization provides a means for young people to have access to job technology. If we look at the US, United States of America, the transition to free access to education was when agriculture started, we started to move in the US from agriculture to manufacturing. And the government realizing that they needed new skills. And that shift happened. So you, we can't delink the position of young people in society to the industrialization that is required of uh, moving from just basic agriculture and exporting of raw materials to the transformation of these goods and service, and these goods on the continent to provide young people with the skills and knowledge that they need to transform. Because ultimately, the transformation journey cannot be just theoretical. It's good to learn about all these good things, but you need to apply them. So in the absence of application within the, the continent, it challenges our ability to actually use the talent and resources of all, the, of all these young people. And being young today on the African continent, for those that have the ability to be connected using um, social media and other forms, but let's not forget about the millions that are in rural areas that are still not necessarily as connected as they should be. And what do we do about their role in society? Because at the moment, they are still the majority. There's a minority of us, you know, I'm no longer that young, but there's a minority of young people that are in society that are connected. But the most important group that we need to focus on are those that are in rural areas. And what opportunities do we give them in rural areas to ensure that it is not just a migration from the first mile to the last mile, which could be a pit stop, being in the city before they go to other places in the world. But part of the transformation of these young people and the energy will happen in rural areas, not necessarily in cities. You know, uh, Carl, this uh, conversation we had scheduled, we had originally um, slated for 45 minutes. And you've um, um, already been with us for 50, but I'm wondering if you could hang on just a little while longer to see if there are additional questions from the group. I, in fact, I think I see one coming, um, here we go, um, through the Q&A uh, platform. What is the Echo Bank Foundation doing specifically to provide support to African countries with the COVID-19 pandemic? So, um, there was a press release a couple of, uh, I think last week, where $3 million were committed to support African countries' response to COVID-19 in countries where we are. We are working very closely with the African Union and the Africa CDC to ensure that we can leverage network capabilities to support uh, the, the response of the African Union, the African Union Development Agency, as well as the Africa CDC. Um, these are 
it's a Pan-African institution working with a Pan-African institution. I guess the largest Pan-African institution in the African Union and the different uh, organs. And that's how we have positioned uh, the response at the African level. But in each country, we have had uh, a contribution that was made to support the national response. And uh, uh, the Echo Bank Academy is a partner with uh, MIT in its Africa Takes on COVID-19 Challenge. Uh, GBSN is also a partner as well, uh, which will happen over the course of uh, this weekend, I guess, continuous work for 48 hours. And um, we're excited about the potential ideas and implementable innovations that will come from that. You know, it's an interesting um, uh, set of ideas that emerged from this conversation. We, we talked a little bit about the, the um, engagement of the private sector, uh, a Pan-African private sector institution working with, uh, you know, Pan-African um, governmental uh, institutions. But what about higher education? How do you see in general you know, we, we talked about training and education and, and how important skills are, but um, to what extent have um, universities and um, business schools in particular been engaged in um, helping Africa to address this challenge? And that would be a, a pause because I, I haven't looked at this. Simon, <laughs> Simon would have been a better place to, uh, to answer that specific question. but. I think the, the reality is that the, some of the doctors and nurses that are working today as front lines are coming from African learning institutions. And this is important to recognize. In 20, in 20, um, during the Ebola crisis, it was African health workers from DRC, from Kenya, from Rwanda, from Africa that went to West Africa that were trained by the African Union to go. So this perception that we don't necessarily have good quality learning institution is not necessarily true because everything has to do with the ongoing willingness to train, retrain, and for people to learn so that we can continue to have that response. And I think uh, learning from the experience of uh, Ebola in 2014 and having the Africa CDC today as a pillar of the response on the continent demonstrates that African institutions that continue to be supported become a pillar of that response. And the people working in these institutions are Africans, many of them probably trained in African institutions. I am not saying that the quality of education today in Africa is the best, but I also recognize the fact that many of us, including myself, went to public schools before we left our respective countries and going to other forms of education. So there, is, there are challenges, but there are also uh, people that strive every day to ensure that you have a good set of young Africans that come out of these, um, of these institutions. Yeah, I see um, not only the education part, but I see increasing strength on the research side, which I think is a critical uh, dimension in, in uh, fighting um, this disease, but, but more importantly, building or rebuilding uh, the, the health system. We have one more question, if we can, uh, Carl, uh, squeeze it in. It's uh, um, the UA nominated a uh, uh, Qatar, I'm not sure I know that word, uh, to negotiate the debt of four people. Four people. Four people. Uh, yeah. To negotiate the debt of Af uh, re negotiate the debt of African countries with the IMF and World Bank, etc. Do you think this is the best way to deal with the debt issues? Or instead, the situation should be seen as an opportunity to ensure better use of resources gathered from donors and uh, fight uh, against money laundering. Money laundering. We, we need to look at these actions in the context of Africa wanting to have uh, interlocutors with institu international institutions. The, the African continental free trade area, if I take that example, is an opportunity to have one discussion with partners, so 54, 55 member states discussing with one partner. It is the same that the African Union is trying to do. Instead of having individual countries going to knock on the door of certain institutions, 
we say let's have a coordinated effort to ensure that we can probably get for now the best deal and eventually see what happens. So Africans need to start to learn about the, Afri the African institution that we have and understand their role in society. It is true that some of them um, are far away from, uh, from, um, from Addis Ababa, but there is technology that we can use to learn about them. I think what the African Union has done is to ensure that there is a coordinated response for, for, uh, for COVID-19 when it comes to uh, health response through the Africa CDC. We realize now that the biggest challenge will be the economic cha challenge. Therefore, let's ensure that we take some of the finest Africans that we have from different parts of the continent to have a coordinated engagement on that particular issue of the debt. Thank you, uh, Carl. This has been amazing. We're Thank out you. of time. It, you have been amazing, and um, I uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate at the Global Business School Network your willingness to talk um, not only with me, but uh, uh, talk uh, with us live about what's happening uh, as we speak and what um, could potentially come from this experience. Uh, we thank you for the work that you've been doing with GBSN, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to make a difference together. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. It's been great. And uh, as you say, it's a beginning. Our engagement started on an article that I, that I had written on the um, role of financial institutions. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you can, we can then uh, make the connection between what uh, the EcoBank Academy is doing to train uh, uh, at least 15,000 people uh, once a year. Um, there are probably more. But also, how do we ensure that the narrative about what is happening in Africa is a conversation between different parts? And that's what you have done. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity that you gave me from this, uh, for us to engage. And if I have one request for anyone that is watching, think about contributing to the Africa series. It is a safe bet because the health of Africans, it is critical to the health of the rest of the world. And if we get it right through African institutions, there is definitely an opportunity to change the conversation about health in Africa. So take well, uh, keep well then, and then we'll chat again soon. All right, look forward to it, Carl. Thank you again. Okay, bye-bye.